At the end of the 1965 James Bond film Thunderball, Bond and leading Lady Domino Del Val, having just defeated the evil organization Spectre in an epic underwater battle, surface and climb aboard a life raft dropped by a passing U.S. Navy B-17. Bond then begins assembling an unusual piece of equipment. He dons a harness, inflates and releases a helium balloon, and attaches a long line from the balloon to the harness. The B-17 then returns and snatches the line, lifting Bond and Domino into the air. The same system appears in 2008's The Dark Knight, used by Batman to exfiltrate mob accountant Lau from Hong Kong, as well as in the Metal Gear Solid series of video games. While certainly cool and dramatic, this device is obviously the product of some screenwriter's fevered imagination and would never work in real life, right? Well, wrong. Amazingly, this system is 100% real, and was developed in the late 1950s for recovering downed pilots and secret agents from enemy territory and other places that could not be reached by helicopter. This is the story of the Fulton surface-to-air recovery system, better known as the Skyhook. Skyhook has its origins in an aerial mailbag recovery system developed in the 1930s by All American Aviation, a small airmail service based in Wilmington, Delaware. Invented by dentist and inventor Dr. Lyle S. Brown, the All American system consisted of a special hook trailed behind the mail plane, connected via steel cable to a motorized winch. The mailbag to be recovered was connected to a short loop of tow rope held up by a pair of 4 meter steel poles placed 6 meters apart. To recover the mailbag, the aircraft flew low, snatched the tow rope loop with the hook, and reeled in the bag using the winch. On May 12, 1939, All American launched an experimental airmail service along the Appalachian Mountains, using a Stinson SR 10C to snatch U.S. Postal Service mailbags from small towns lacking airfields. Shortly before America's entry into the Second World War, the All-American system came to the attention of the U.S. Army Air Force as a solution to an unexpected logistical problem. Following the spectacular success of German glider-borne troops during the 1940 invasion of Denmark, France, and the Low Countries, the USAAF began developing its own assault glider, what would eventually become the WACO CG-4. At nearly $15,000 a piece, however, the CG-4 was deemed too expensive to be used only once like German and British gliders, and the Army Air Force began searching for a means of recovering gliders from the battlefield for reuse. In response, All-American Aviation modified its mailbag recovery system, and in September 1941 demonstrated its use at Wright Field in Ohio, using a modified Stinson to snatch a 230-kilogram Midwest Utility Sports Glider into the air. As the shock of the pickup could easily damage the glider, as soon as the hook caught the tow line, the winch cable was paid out and slowly braked, reducing the acceleration to less than 1 g over 3 to 6 seconds. The glider recovery, or snatch, system was gradually perfected and fitted to USAAF C-47 Skytrain transport aircraft, entering service in late 1942. The system was used to recover gliders following Operation Overlord, Operation Market Garden, and Operation Varsity, but saw far greater use in the Far East for evacuating wounded personnel. Perhaps the most famous use of the All-American system was in the rescue of the passengers and crew of Gremlin Special, a C-47 that crashed during a sightseeing flight over the Shangri-La Valley, New Guinea, on May 13, 1945. Five days after the crash, two medics parachuted in to tend to injured survivors, while a squad of troops was dropped further down the valley to clear a small airstrip in the jungle. Three CG-4 gliders were landed on the airstrip, the survivors and medics loaded aboard, and the gliders snatched into the air and towed to safety. In addition to snatching gliders, the Army Air Force also experimented with using the All-American system to recover secret agents, downed aircrew, and other personnel from rough terrain or enemy territory. However, this proved far more of a challenge, as people are considerably lighter than assault gliders. Initial experiments, conducted in July 1943 using weighted, instrumented containers, were less than promising, with the instruments recording accelerations of up to 17 Gs, far more than the average human body can withstand. Modifications to the tow line and harness eventually reduced the acceleration to a more acceptable 7 Gs, and experiments continued using sheep as test subjects. While the first attempted pickup ended with the sheep being strangled by the tow line, subsequent animals fared better, and the system was soon ready for human tests. Lieutenant Alex Doster, a U.S. Army paratrooper, volunteered for the first human pickup, 
and on September 5th was snatched into the air at 200 kilometers an hour, suffering no ill effects. The perfected All-American system, consisting of a harness, tow line, and two collapsible poles, was condensed into a portable man pickup kit, which could be airdropped to personnel on the ground. However, there is no evidence the system was ever used operationally during the Second World War. The dawn of the Cold War brought new opportunities for using the All-American system. In 1952, the CIA launched Operation Tropic, an attempt to establish a resistance network against the Chinese Communist Party in northern Manchuria. Agents would be dropped into Kirin province by parachute and later extracted via All-American pickup. To prepare for the operation, pilots of the Civil Air Transport, a covert Chinese nationalist airline, conducted dozens of practice pickups in Japan. The first operational pickup was attempted on November 29, 1952 by a CAT C-47, with CIA officers John T. Downey and Richard G. Fecteau aboard. Unfortunately, the mission was betrayed by a Chinese double agent, and the aircraft was shot down as it came in to make the pickup. Pilots Norman Schwartz and Robert Snoddy were killed, but Downey and Fecteau survived and were captured by the Chinese. The two officers remained in Chinese custody for two decades, Fecteau being released in December 1971, and Downey in March 1973. This fiasco laid bare one of the major flaws of the all-American system. Pickups required retrieving aircraft to fly at extremely low altitudes, making them highly vulnerable to enemy ground fire. But one man thought he could do better. Born in New York on April 15, 1909, Robert Edison Fulton Jr. seemed to have innovation in his blood, a distant descendant of steamboat pioneer Robert Fulton, his middle name came from none other than inventor Thomas Edison, a friend of his father, Robert Fulton Sr. The elder Fulton was president of Mack Trucks, while Robert Jr.'s uncle, Elgin Travis, was the founder of the Greyhound bus line. After studying architecture at Harvard and the University of Vienna, in 1932 Robert Fulton Jr. embarked on an epic motorcycle trip from London to Tokyo, covering 40,000 kilometers in 18 months. Along the way, he visited 32 countries, dined with Indian Rajas, was shot at by Pashtun tribesmen, spent a night in a Turkish prison, and shot over 40,000 feet of film, which he later edited into a documentary titled One Man Caravan. On the outbreak of the Second World War, Fulton applied his inventive talents to supporting the war effort. The result was the Gun Air Structure, a simulator that used films projected on a screen to train pilots in aerial gunnery techniques. The U.S. Navy purchased 500 of the devices, which became the standard wartime gunnery trainer for naval aviators. After the war, Fulton turned his attention to a more ambitious project, a flying car he called the Airphibian. Like many inventors in the optimistic post-war years, Fulton believed that every American family would soon have an airplane in their garage, and set up a workshop beside the airport in Danbury, Connecticut, to develop and manufacture the Airphibian. Typical of many subsequent designs, Fulton's flying car, more properly a rotable aircraft, consisted of a streamlined cabin on four small spatted wheels, which could be fitted with a propeller and a combination of wing tail unit to convert it into a light aircraft. The same set of controls were used for both driving and flying. In December 1950, the Airphibian was flight tested and certified by the Civil Aeronautics Administration, the first flying car to be so registered. By this time, however, Fulton had run out of funds and was forced to sell the manufacturing rights to his invention. The purchasing company chose not to develop the vehicle, and the Airphibian, like so many flying car schemes, fell by the wayside. But the venture would inspire Fulton's most famous invention. While test-flying one of the Airphibian prototypes, Fulton began to wonder what would happen if he was forced down over rough terrain too remote for helicopters of the time to reach. One potential solution was the All-American system, which Fulton had seen demonstrated outside London near the end of the war. However, Fulton had immediately recognized the system's shortcomings, particularly the need for a large open area to set up the pickup loop and support poles. Thus, following the failure of the Airphibian venture, Fulton set about developing a more viable aerial pickup system. Fulton's major innovation was to dispense with the poles and pickup loop and instead suspend the recovery line from a helium balloon. This system allowed pickups to be carried out even from densely forested terrain and the recovery aircraft to fly at much higher altitudes, protecting it from collisions with ground obstacles and enemy ground fire. 
Fulton began his experiments in 1950 using a weather balloon, a nylon recovery line, and 15-pound test weights. After working out the kinks in the system, he approached Rear Admiral Luis de Flores, who had been instrumental in negotiating the Navy's adoption of the gun air structure during the war. Flores, now Director of Technical Research at the CIA, put Fulton in touch with the Office of Naval Research, who agreed to fund the development of his aerial recovery system through its Air Programs Division. ONR testing began in 1954 using a Lockheed P-2V Neptune based out of El Centro, California, with pickups of instrumented weights taking place over the Colorado desert. The recovery gear developed by Fulton, which could be airdropped to a downed airman, consisted of a parachute harness, a 150-meter nylon recovery line, a dart-shaped suspension balloon, and a helium bottle to inflate the balloon. A sleeping bag-like windshield made of rubberized fabric was also developed for recoveries in poor weather. Meanwhile, the recovery aircraft was fitted with a pair of 9-meter long tubular guide booms, or horns, protruding from its nose at a 70-degree angle to capture the recovery line. To prevent the line from becoming fouled in the aircraft's propellers in the event of an unsuccessful catch, deflector cables were also strung between the nose and the wingtips. To effect a pickup, an airman donned the harness, connected to the recovery line and the balloon, then inflated and released the balloon. The recovery aircraft then flew into the line, the pilot aiming for a brightly colored mylar marker fixed at the 130 meter level. For night recoveries, battery-powered lights were used to mark the line. Once the line had been caught and the airmen lifted into the air, the recovery crew aboard the aircraft used a long snatch pole to catch the line and connect it to an onboard winch. The airmen could then be winched aboard, the whole process taking around six minutes start to finish. Making the recovery process safe and reliable presented a number of technical challenges, the most difficult being the development of a sky anchor mechanism to automatically connect the recovery line to the aircraft and cut loose the balloon. Without such a mechanism, the drag of the balloon would winch the recovered airmen uncontrollably into the capture booms, severely injuring or killing them. Finding a sufficiently lightweight recovery line that could reliably withstand the shock of pickup without snapping was also a major challenge. Eventually, however, Fulton and the ONR team managed to refine the system enough to proceed to live testing using pigs. The first pig to be recovered spun wildly as it trailed behind the recovery aircraft and was winched aboard in a disoriented state. Upon recovery, the pig, perhaps understandably, proceeded to attack the recovery crew. Subsequent tests were more promising, and on August 12, 1958, Staff Sergeant Levi Woods of the U.S. Marine Corps became the first person to be picked up using the Fulton system, the recovery aircraft picking up the line at a speed of 125 knots. Woods described the experience as, like a kick in the pants. Further testing took place into 1959 at Quantico, Virginia and Elgin Air Force Base, Florida, the experiments revealing, among other things, that the uncontrolled spinning experienced by the test pigs could easily be countered by the airmen extending their arms and legs. In 1959, the refined system was officially adopted as the Fulton Surface-to-Air Recovery System, or STARS, known informally among pilots as Skyhook. The system could be used in clearings as small as 9 meters square surrounded by 30 meter high obstacles, and could safely recover cargo or human payloads weighing up to 130 kilograms, with a peak acceleration of 4.5 to 10 Gs. Versions were developed for a variety of aircraft, including the Lockheed C-130 Hercules, Fairchild C-123 Provider, Douglas B-66 Destroyer, de Havilland CV-2 Caribou, and Grumman S-2 Tracker though the latter two aircraft are not known to have been used operationally in this role. Aside from the guide booms and deflector wires, which required modifications to the aircraft structure, the system was designed to be easily fitted to existing aircraft. The Skyhook package for the C-130, for example, consisted of a self-contained pallet mounting the electric winch and other hardware, which could be attached to the floor of the aircraft's cargo door using existing tie-downs. The system also included a wraparound fence and a one-way swinging gate to prevent the recovered airmen from falling out of the aircraft when their harness was disconnected. At least 40 Air Force HC MC-130 combat Talon aircraft were modified for Skyhook operations. In addition to the guide booms and winch pallet, these aircraft were fitted with airdroppable Fulton recovery kits and stretchers for 26 patients, 25 spare winch drums, a galley, an emergency oxygen system, and extra seats for medical personnel. A two-person recovery harness was also later developed, 
the first experimental dual pickup being performed by Colonel Allison Brooks and Airman 3rd Class Ronald Dahl at Edwards Air Force Base, California, in May 1966. The first field tests of Skyhook were conducted in August 1960 near Point Barrow, Alaska. Under the direction of Robert Fulton, Dr. Max Brewer of the Navy Arctic Research Laboratory, and Captain Edward A. Rogers of the Naval Air Development Unit, a Skyhook-equipped P-2V Neptune recovered mail from the Fletcher's Ice Island Meteorological Drift Station, as well as geological samples and mastodon tusks from an archaeological expedition at Peters Lake. This mission also saw the first human Skyhook recovery under operational conditions, when a rescue package was airdropped to the icebreaker USS Burton Island and the aerial pickup conducted from the deck of the ship. The U.S. Air Force considered using Skyhook to extract the Dalai Lama from Chinese-occupied Tibet and down CIA pilot Alan Pope from Indonesia, but both missions were ultimately abandoned. However, the perfect opportunity would soon appear for Skyhook to prove its utility. In May 1961, a U.S. Navy patrol aircraft flying a geomagnetic survey over the Arctic Ocean spotted the abandoned Soviet drift station NP-9 on the ice below. The Soviets had been operating drift stations on Arctic ice flows for nearly three decades, starting with NP-1 in 1937. Officially, the stations performed peaceful scientific research, including meteorology, geophysics, oceanology, and marine biology. But U.S. intelligence had long suspected that they were also secretly used for submarine tracking and signals intelligence. Days before being spotted by the Navy patrol, the ice runway used to supply NP-9 was destroyed by a pressure ridge, forcing the crew to abandon the station. The Soviets assumed the station would quickly be destroyed by the fracturing ice, but it remained intact far longer than expected, presenting the United States with a potential bonanza of intelligence. There was only one problem. The ice pack was too dense to be reached by icebreaker, while the station lay beyond helicopter range. It was the perfect job for the Skyhook system. Rear Admiral L.D. Coates, Chief of Naval Research, greenlit a daring recovery mission, codenamed Operation Cold Feet. Operation Cold Feet was scheduled for September 1961, when weather and daylight would be ideal and NP-9 would be within 1,000 kilometers of Thule Air Force Base in Greenland. The commander of the operation, Captain John Cadwallader, chose two men to carry out the mission. Air Force Major James Smith, an experienced paratrooper and Russian linguist who had served on American drift stations, and Naval Reserve Lieutenant Leonard Leshak, a former Antarctic geophysicist. Leshak, who was not jump qualified, underwent parachute training at Naval Air Station Lakehurst, New Jersey, while both men trained on the Skyhook system over the summer at Naval Air Station Patuxent River, Maryland. But just as preparations were nearing completion, the operation was placed on hold. NP-9 had drifted farther than anticipated and was now out of range of Thule. Thankfully, in March 1962, the Navy learned that another Soviet drift station, NP-8, had recently been abandoned. The station was more up-to-date than NP-9 and close enough to be reached from the Royal Canadian Air Force Base at Resolute Bay, Northwest Territories. Captain Cadwallader had hoped that the United States Hydrographic Office's monthly ice reconnaissance flight between Thule and Point Barrow, Alaska would provide an up-to-date position for the station, but poor visibility prevented a sighting from being made. So in mid-April, a Navy P-2V supported by an Air Force C-130 flew to Resolute Bay and began to search for the station. Once again, poor weather complicated the search, and it was not until May 4th the station was finally spotted. Unfortunately, by this time the operation had run out of Navy funds, forcing it to be shelved once again. But Cadwallader, figuring that the CIA might be interested in the operation, approached the agency and succeeded in obtaining the required funding. Cold Feet was back on. This time, however, the staging area moved to Point Barrow to avoid having to secure Canadian permission to use Resolute Bay. The recovery aircraft was also changed to a converted B-17 Flying Fortress operated by Intermountain Aviation, a CIA front company. On May 26, the B-17, flown by Intermountain pilots Connie Segrist and Douglas Price and carrying Major Smith, Lieutenant Lachak, and Pan American Airways navigator William Jordan, set off in search of NP-8. But once again the station proved elusive, and after 13 hours of searching, the crew returned to Point Barrow empty-handed. On May 28th, however, the B-17, assisted by a Navy P-2V, finally located the station and prepared to carry out the operation. 
After selecting a drop zone and dropping streamers to check the wind, Major Smith jumped through the aircraft's bomb bay, followed by Lieutenant Lachak. The two men landed safely on the ice and radioed their arrival to Segrist and Price. After dropping supplies onto the ice, the two pilots headed back for Point Barrow. Smith and Lachak were on their own. The mission plan gave Smith and Lachak 72 hours to explore NP-8 and gather whatever intelligence they could find. Meanwhile, back at Point Barrow, maintenance crews installed the pickup booms and other recovery equipment on the B-17 and prepared to carry out the recovery operation. After conducting a number of practice pickups to test the equipment, on May 31st the B-17 and the CIA pickup crew set off in search of the drift station. Unfortunately, dense fog obscured the view of the ice, and after hours of fruitless searching, the aircraft was forced to return to Point Barrow. The next day's search was equally unsuccessful, but on June 2nd, a Navy P-2V with better navigational equipment guided the B-17 to the station, where it made three separate pickups. First, of a package containing photographic film, documents, and equipment from the station, followed by Lieutenant Lachak, and finally Major Smith. The recovery operation was a harrowing one, as a fierce wind caught the skyhook balloon and dragged Lachak and Smith across the ice before the B-17 finally snatched the recovery line. Despite this, both men were successfully recovered, and the aircraft returned safely to Point Barrow. Operation Cold Feet was a stunning success, giving U.S. intelligence valuable insight into Soviet oceanography and submarine detection technology, and proving the utility of the Skyhook system for difficult extraction missions. However, it was to be Skyhook's only triumph, officially at least. While Skyhook-equipped aircraft were deployed to Vietnam to rescue downed airmen, the system was never used operationally during the conflict. And while there are rumors that the CIA used Skyhook on several occasions to extract agents from enemy territory, no such missions have been officially confirmed. In any event, Skyhook became increasingly irrelevant as advances in air-to-air -air refueling gave rescue helicopters the range they previously lacked. Yet the Air Force continued to maintain the capability to deploy Skyhook, conducting no fewer than 75 demonstration pickups between 1966 and 1982. Incredibly, given the high-risk nature of pickup operations, only one fatality ever occurred while using Skyhook. On April 26, 1982, during a practice pickup over Canadian Forces Base Lahr in Germany, U.S. Army Sergeant First Class Clifford Strickland fell to his death when a bushing failed on the winch mechanism, causing the recovery line to break free. As a result of this incident, an emergency parachute was integrated into the standard Skyhook harness. However, by this time the Air Force had already started phasing out the system, and in September 1996, the last Skyhook-equipped squadrons were deactivated. While outwardly an implausibly elaborate and potentially extremely dangerous system, during its brief service, the Fulton surface-to-air recovery system proved itself to be a surprisingly safe, efficient, and reliable solution to the problem of recovering equipment and personnel from inaccessible terrain. Unfortunately, this was a problem for which more practical solutions were soon developed, and today Skyhook is little more than a footnote in the history of aerial rescue operations. Still, that such a potentially dangerous system worked as well as it did is a testament to the inventive genius of Robert Fulton Jr., and proof that sometimes truth is stranger than fiction.